This is a short video on schistosomiasis. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of schistosomiasis. As in all of these videos, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right. And I'll be clearing all the boxes and repopulating the flowchart as we talk about each concept. Let's go ahead and get started. Schistosomiasis is caused by a pathogen called schistosomes, and this is a parasitic trematode. There are three types that are worth knowing. There's Schistosoma mansoni, Schistosoma hematobium, and Schistosoma japonicum. Mansoni comes from South America, Caribbean, and Africa. Hematobium comes from Africa and the Middle East, and japonicum sounds like Japan, so it comes from Southeast Asia and China. Now, it's important to note that you don't get schistomiasis anywhere in these areas or in these countries. That would be pretty widespread. It's usually found in rural areas with freshwater sources and poor sanitation. So remember freshwater and poor sanitation. And this will become relevant as we talk about the life cycle for schistosomiasis in just a second. So we're going to fill in the blanks of this life cycle and hopefully have a better idea of how it infects humans and how it spreads from one human to the other and eventually cause the manifestations. So regardless of which schistosome you're infected with, you're going to have the cercaria, the larva form of the schistosome, penetrate the skin. Now at this point, it's worth showing this image that shows the different stages in the life form of the schistosomes. So the one that penetrates the skin is the almost adult form, the cercaria form. Next, once it penetrates, oh, before that, once it, pen um, it the humans are the definitive hosts of schistosomiasis. We'll see later that some freshwater snails are a temporary or intermediate host. So this infecting the humans is the larva form cercaria going into its definitive host. Once they penetrate the skin, they then enter the circulation, so they go through the bloodstream. They then mature into the adult schistosomes, so they then take on this form, and they can migrate to the veins of the target organs. The female adults then lay eggs, so now you have a bunch of eggs in the target organs, and that triggers an inflammatory reaction. You can have capillary closure and chronic inflammation in the affected organs. The eggs then penetrate the lumen of the intestines and the bladder of the humans. So you probably see where this is going. The humans are going to poop and pee out the eggs. So the infected human will excrete the eggs in urine and feces, and then the eggs end up in water, some fresh water source, where they hatch and they release these mercadia uh, life forms. These are flat ciliated larvae. So this is, you can kind of think of it as like the baby. So you have the egg that hatches into the mercadia. The mercadia then infect these freshwater snails, and the freshwater snails are an intermediate host. And then the mercadia develop into the cercaria, and then they're released back into the water where they can then infect other humans that come into contact with that water, such as while swimming or um, using the fresh water for some reason. So that being said, we can now use the life cycle to talk about the different manifestations of schistosomiasis. And the manifestations depend on where you're coming into contact and where in the life cycle the schistosomes are. So as soon as they penetrate the skin, they can cause this local reaction. It's called a swimmer's itch or a circarial dermatitis. It's a puritic macropapular rash at the point of entry into the human skin. Another form is a more systemic, widespread reaction. It's called acute schistosomiasis syndrome. This happens from the, the bug, the, the parasite, when it's in an adult form, or also from the eggs. And what's going on here is a serum sickness-like reaction. So you're going to have immune complex formation of antigens released from the eggs or from the adult worms. And you're going to have these immune complexes that deposit throughout the body, and you'll have a big immune reaction to all of those. So the incubation for this is usually three to six weeks, and then you have these broad systemic symptoms listed here. So that includes fever, fatigue, cough, myalgias or muscle aches, and angioedema. Now this usually resolves on its own spontaneous recovery after two to ten weeks. The other major manifestations of schistosomiasis depend on the organ system that they are that they're inside. So the eggs kind of go to all of these organ systems and have their own individual reaction and affect that organ system. So for example, you can have genitourinary schistosomiasis. This causes hematuria and dysuria in some patients. It can also cause a rare tumor, squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, which can also present with painless hematuria. 
You can have granulomatous inflammation in the female reproductive tract, so in the ovaries, fallopian tubes, cervix, and vagina, which can lead to infertility in women. On the contrast, in men, it doesn't really affect the reproductive tract as much. You can also have bladder neck obstruction, which can lead to hydronephrosis and uh, symptoms of hydronephrosis, like pain over your kidneys as they fill with water. The bugs can affect the hepatospleen, the liver and the spleen, so you can have hepatosplenic schistomsomiasis. This can result in hepatosplenomegaly on exam. You can also have periportal fibrosis, which can result in portal hypertension in patients. So you can also have symptoms of portal hypertension. I haven't listed them here, but that can include, uh, for instance, like uh, esophageal varices or swelling in the esophagus as well as hemorrhoids in uh, the lower GI tract. Next, you can have intestinal schistosomiasis. This can cause intestinal distress, like abdominal pain or diarrhea. It can also cause bowel structures with all that inflammation, which can even exacerbate the diarrhea and the abdominal pain. It can also cause intestinal bleeding, which can, after some time, cause an iron deficiency anemia. Next, pulmonary schistosomiasis. This one can cause pulmonary hypertension, which can lead to core pulmonale and symptoms of right heart failure. This can be a JVD, jugular venous distension, or lower extremity edema, or perhaps a hepatojugular reflux. Lastly on this list, you can have neuroschistosomiasis. This can present as headaches as well as sensory and motor deficits. It can cause a transverse myelitis and associated symptoms, and it can cause seizures and epilepsy as well. One last note on the diagnosis of schistosomiasis, you're going to have a bunch of clinical clues as to what kind of reaction it is and which organ systems it's affecting. You might also have a travel history in the diagnosis, but the definitive diagnosis, the gold standard, is going to be direct visualization of the schistosome in some form uh, via the eggs themselves, via stool or urine microscopy. So the same way that the schistosomes perpetuate the life cycle is how you're gonna diagnose it. You're gonna see the eggs that are released in the human feces or human urine. I hope this video on schistosomes and schistosomiasis was helpful, and thank you for listening.